This is Roberto Martinez and you're listening to Follow Tonians podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to this special edition of the Follow Tonians podcast featuring a interview with Roberto Martinez. We were joined by nsno.co.uk, footyscene.com, sos1878.com, bluekipper.com and when skies are grey. Enjoy. Well, welcome all. Good to see you all. Can I, can I start with a question about, yes. today about the FA Commission? A lot of talk about the B-Leagues, yes. um, strategic loan partners as well. And Obviously, coming from Spain, you'll, you'll obviously yeah. be aware of how the B system is used over there. Yes. Do you think that can work in this country? 100%. Yeah, and I think there's a real need to find... I think I know there's going to be a lot of negative comments because any time that you want to do something different, you're going to get people against it. Um, I used it first experience, first time as a player, developing through a B side, and the B sides around France, Germany, Holland, Spain, give the younger players an advantage, and that's unfortunately what the English players are suffering when you go into European Championships and, and international games. You haven't got that first team experience. The B sides will work. The problem is how you're gonna set it up and what parameters. The player, the young player, needs to play first in football. That's why we send the players out on loan and we see a real benefit. The problem is that you don't control the way of playing. You can control how you want them to be educated towards playing the first team. So the B side is the answer. Will it work? It would depend on the small details. What, what, um, uh, what league they're going to be set? Is promotion going to be allowed? Are they going to be allowed to play in cup competitions? There are many details that they're going to be the difference between being a success or not. But in terms of development of the young players, it's exactly what we need. What about the thoughts on the proposition of only two EU players on a match day squad? Because that's going to hurt everyone, I think. And I know we're trying to promote youth, but still, mm. you need that mix. You do, yeah. And I think, remember that it's not about um, um, being specific about how in homegrown players or having players from Europe or is about having good players. So whoever we sign in terms of foreign market, Ross Barkley will play. And and that's the top top and bottom. We need to produce good players. And good players from abroad, they are positive influences. So I am not too keen about restricting numbers in that respect. Do you think we'll um, you mentioned using young players and the loan system's great for developing young players. With Europa League next season, do you think uh, we'll be using a lot of the young players in the Europa League or will it be a bit of a mix? <coughs> so hard to, hard to say. No, I think it's, it's, it's important that we increase. We work this season about with 22 outfield players. Next season, if we are in the Europa League group stages, we need to work with 27, 28. What that means is that it's going to be young players, clearly, but we need to have a bigger squad. Playing in Europe shouldn't be an excuse to drop the standards in the domestic leagues. But it shouldn't be a competition that we only use young players in the same way. So it's getting, we're embracing the challenge of being in Europe. We need to be forced of coping with playing Thursday and Sundays and not use it as a, an excuse. And just for that, we need to get the right signings. But the answer is yes, young players will get opportunities. Even now, I'm very disappointed that <coughs> Ryan Letson had to join on the, on the 17th. I felt that Ryan deserved to make the debut this season and it was very close against against Southampton and, and Ryan has got a fantastic future as another three players of his generation but they've got a real good opportunity but we need to have players that they are ready and we're going to have good youngsters but we need a strong enough squad. And all Luke Garbutt and uh, Ty Brown, are they two others which they are. might get the opportunity Luke, next year? Obviously Luke played mm. against Southampton and I've been so impressed with him. It's just measuring what he needs next. Does he need more playing time rather than just being fighting for minutes in the first team? And that's a decision that we need to make. And Tyus Browning is exactly the same. The boy is ready physically and defensively. He's, he's ready for the Premier League and he's got incredible talent. Again, that decision is going to be after preseason. I'm going to look if he needs a lot of minutes or is ready to stay behind here and fight for, for his time. But those two, uh, I consider them first team players even though they haven't played that much. John Stone was brought into the team, I think it was around Christmas time, as a result of injuries to Jackson Distan. 
how do you see his role progressing next season? Because obviously he's been remarkable since he broke into the side. Yes. Is there a certain amount of games that you'd like him to play next season? Well, remember that John Stones, when, when he arrived at the club, he came as a... Uh, obviously, I knew John Stones really well because I followed him closely at Barnsley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, we good missed out at that time, <laughs> yes. And obviously, everything works for the good. And John, John has only played, I would say, seven games at centre out. That's an incredible stat for a player that is coming into the Premier League and he had to cope with dealing with a striker like Andy Carroll or dealing with a striker like Wayne Rooney and he's, he's excelled. He's still a young man and he needs to work at his game but John Stones is going to be one of the best centre-halves that English football has ever seen. So John is very much uh, an already made player. Uh, I do think that he's a centre-half. I don't think he's a right-back. I think right-back can fit in there. Like many players can play different roles but his DNA has been a, an elegant centre-half, a modern centre-half that he can start the play, he can, he can be very influential of how you're going to uh, attack and then defensively can get left 1v1s, he's good in the air, he's quick, sharp and he's just learning slowly. I think Phil J. Yelke, people don't realise Phil J. Yelke has been an incredible influence on John this season even when um, when he was injured. He would come in in the dressing room at half time and he would give him a word of advice and i never seen such an important role for a senior player like I've seen this season with Phil Yelp and John Stones. Normally when you're a senior player, you see a young player doing well, you see a bit of a, well, where's this young man going? And it's, it's been incredible to see that relationship. Given that he's, he's performed so well, he's excelled and he showed the great maturity, there have been one or two people suggesting that he could actually go to Brazil. Would that be something that you'd welcome and you think that would support his development? Because obviously yeah. there's not many central defenders like John Stones who can carry the ball out and there's obviously been comparisons to, to Rio Ferdinand when he was yeah. that sort of age, and there's not many yeah. of his counterparts that can do that. Yeah, I think if you would say to me, would, would, he, uh, would John Stones be ready to play every game for England in the World Cup, I would say that, would be, that's, that wouldn't be right. If you would say, can John Stones handle the, the expectations and the pressure of being a squad like the World Cup squad for England, 100%, I think he showed it this season. Uh, different type of games, different situations, he's, he's ready. But he's only 19, and we need to protect him a little bit. And I know and I admire a lot Roy Hodgson's uh, ideas behind the young players in England set up. They know John really well through, through his time in the under-21s. So I know they're going to make the right decision. So if John goes with the under-21s in the Toulon tournament, that's going to be a fitting moment for his season. If he goes to the World Cup, it's going to be an incredible experience. But in the same way, I would expect to the whole English football environment to protect John yeah. Stones a little bit and don't expect too much to early. Thank you. Speaking a little bit more about defence, um, a few people raised their eyebrows a little bit when you played a modified 3-5-2 against City. Mm -hmm. um, we know you favoured it in the past. Is it something that maybe with us having quite a lot of depth at centre-back you'd think about? Use a little bit more maybe next season? Yes, yeah, definitely. I think the the work, the key is to be flexible as a team. And the big the, in the modern game, I don't think you can you can um, um, you can challenge with everyone unless you are flexible. If you are given, well, that's what we are, and tactically that's what you expect. I think you you lose a little bit of an of an edge. I do feel that this, the team is ready now to play different shapes, and not just play them, I think, to play them well. The back three, with the centre of the way of the club, is a phenomenal system for us. I think it depends on the position, it depends on where you want to play the game, it depends on many tweaks about how, how, how do you want to approach that game, but clearly being a flexible team in the modern game is a big advantage. Um, Coming to the end of the season now, um, and you strike me as someone who wants to keep on learning constantly. Uh, is there one or two lessons that you think stand out from this season that you've learnt? Um, well, many, many. I would be, <laughs> <laughs> we could be talking for, for hours. I think, I think the, uh, what I realised that when you've got such a strong group of senior players, and now we're talking just about the dressing room, uh, like a, tell you about the fans and tell you about the football club but choosing about the dressing room 
we are so fortunate to have players like Leon Osman, Tony Hewitt, Phil Jagielka, Tim Howard, Sylvan Distan, that maybe people just judge them by playing or not playing at the weekend. And I just realized with these core players, if we keep them, um, we can benefit so much from the young players. I think many clubs will be afraid to play young players because it's, it's a bit of a gamble or it's difficult to get results with, with young players. The biggest trend that we have in our dressing room is the young players get help by the senior figures and then the young players bring something that we're missing, which could be bravery, energy, legs, uh, being arrogant and everything is measured in the right manner because of the senior figures. So I just feel that the, the senior players at the club are so important for the future and for what we want to do that we can really match anyone in the league because of that mixture that we have in the dressing room. So that would be the biggest lessons that I've learned this season. How are you doing? Just uh, obviously you're talking about like, the need to get the squad up to say 27, 28 players and obviously we have the players we can use. Um, and obviously, you know, we look at to bring players in and what have you. And you kind of, as a fan, you kind of, obviously you can't mention names like that, mm. but you kind of, you know, some transfers sort of like just keep up on them, they just there, they just happen. And then you hear stories of where say transfers and months in the making and that. Yeah. I mean, I suppose is the stuff bubbling up the now? It is, yeah. It's always uh, uh, I think the, the when you recruit a player is you need to pick a player that you think the character will yeah. fit in, in the in the ethos of the football club and to be at Everton you need to fit in what's already in place. So I could tell you now a list of uh, hundred players that we know they fit that that category. Now, I you mean, won't say anything. Are you going to share the list? <laughs> no, 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 even even if I share the list, yeah. can you sign them? Are they available uh, financially? Can we afford them? Um, are they coming in a position that, for example, we got two young players that we don't want to stop the progression? Yeah. There are many things that they need to come into turn. So. I wouldn't be, I know that as fans, you'd always want to know the new players and I would tell you that this season is the opposite. Just be worried about not losing what we got. Whoever's going to come in is going to be a character that it can fit in and is going to bring something different. We're going to use the loan market, we're going to bring players on loan, we're going to use the money that we have to, to spread it out and, and have as a strong squad as we can because I don't want to see the, I don't want to see during next season the excuse of saying, oh, we have to travel to the Europa League game and that affects the game. That's, that's from now, we start working how we're going to stop that. Maybe some of the staff will get split and the staff won't travel to the Europa League and they'll stay behind doors and some players will the same. And, and we're going to make it clearly from the beginning two different competitions. We, we, we are ready to embrace it. So to answer your question is there are many names. We know exactly what we want. And it'll be a matter of bringing it all together. But as we did last window in, in, in the summer, I think you can get a real sense of trust in the football club because everything is in place. Once something happens, everything is going to come on. We're not reactive club, put it that way. We are anticipating things and we're putting things in place. And case of scenario one, two, three, four, five, and, and so on. So it's going to be exciting. But the biggest thing for the Bretonian is let's don't lose anything that we got in this squad. We know Gareth Barry is finishing his loan, Romero Lukaku is finishing his loan, Gerard Delofeu is, is going to be difficult to have them back, but that was never the plan. The plan was for them to be here one season and have a successful period with us and create great memories. We've done that. Next step is next squad for next season. I suppose just following on from that, you know, you kind of said you maybe got a list of 100 players and <coughs> character fits what you yeah. want. How do you get that sort of knowledge from the Um it's, it's, like it's very interesting. Or... Yeah, I think we got scouts and obviously when I arrived at the club, we had a fantastic uh, recruitment structure. The network is very, very good. It's just tweaking it a little bit and maybe looking for different things. And uh, this scouts is an incredible. Uh, a scout could give you a report on the player, mm -hmm. and then it could give you another report on 
the way he, the way he warm up, the way he address the press after, the way uh, all his build uh, leading up to the game. We try to see training sessions, the way he interacts with the teammates, the way he celebrates the goals. <laughs> <laughs> there are many things that they'll, they'll give you a profile of the type of player and I always meet the player before we sign them, always. So there is a certain of, we, we got a little bit of a structure to build a, some sort of a profile that it goes away from what it is at football. Um, when we met last time, you, you might not recall, but one of the last the questions that was asked was around Sort of going to places and winning games, mm -hmm. and we were just in front of the uh, the Anfield derby. And clearly, we didn't go there and do something. Something went wrong. Yeah, was that one of the low points of the season? Um, it was a low point in terms of understanding that that result was hurtful and for the fans would be um, very difficult. But in the same way, that was a. That was a breaking point for us that allowed us to be the team that we were from that point on. You're looking at that game, and it's the first time that we got, as an Everton team, going to Anfield and getting 500 passes. We were very good in many aspects of the game, and we were so naive in being exposed on the counter-attack, which that's the real strength of this Liverpool side. So I think we, we got affected by playing at Anfield, and it was the psychological side of going 1-0 down at Anfield and we couldn't get back into it when as a team and the way we played we should have scored that day. Mm -hmm. So there were many aspects that they were highlighted in terms that we had to work on. So if you ask me that 4-0 defeat, did he have a positive or negative effect in the season? It had a really negative effect for 15 minutes because we knew what it meant and, and how bad we felt. But from that point it was the key moment of the season for everyone to understand going anywhere in the league we're going to be ourselves whatever happens we'll face adversity and we'll always play well and it take it took us into a into the next level hello hi it's <laughs> going back on just the eyes met way too long to you um just going back to the speculation thing and i've, I've heard, watched all your press conferences this year it's done normally to be honest <laughs> But, um, and it's been brought up many times about players and you kind of embrace that our players are linked with everywhere else mm -hmm. and it seems to be a, a common theme in the media that Everton have got no money so therefore any time we have a good player someone's going to bid and he's going to be off and you kind of embrace that because it, it's a reflection of us doing well yeah. what I've been asked a lot of is your name's popped up quite regularly over mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks about moving on I don't expect you to sit here and say I am or I'm not mm -hmm. but how does that make you feel? Because you're obviously only 10 months into the job as you're getting touted for Barcelona and yeah, Tottenham Hotspur. And yeah, no, no, <laughs> it, I think it's a great point. Remember that in the modern day now, we've got so many platforms, social media, and you've got a 24 hours channel of, of news, and they need those sort of stories. So when you are in a club that, it doesn't matter if you've got money or not, but yeah. you have to sell to survive then you're, you're very anxious and in a very, very difficult place when those rumours come out. As a club, maybe we haven't got the money that other clubs have, but we don't have to sell to survive. It's the, it's the opposite. We got, we, we got financially, we got a very good footing. So these stories are fantastic football compliments. If you see players that are performing well and the other clubs will be prepared to pay X amounts, I think it gives, it gives you a great sense of pride when you can control that. Whenever a player leaves Everton, it's going to be for the right reasons. And if we are sad to see a player go, it's going to be that the club is in a better position because we'll be able to use the money and bring two or three players and, and, and move on. I will never, it would be stupid from us to expect that we're going to keep every player because you don't want to keep players that they get stale, but you don't, gonna, you don't want to keep players that they need to move on. It, it, that's, that's a natural part of the game. And I think we've seen that with Marouane Fellaini, obviously he'd done nearly well. I think all of us sat here probably would say that he was at the end of his Everton career. Not mm -hmm. that we wanted him to go, but he'd had a really good time and he'd been here five years, which for a foreign player at Monk yes, Club is, yeah, a, good, no, is a good amount of time anyway. Yeah. But we sold him and James McCarthy, has been, for me, has been but, far and above our best players. But remember with Marouane Fellaini, is a really um, good example. Marouane Fellaini was the 
most significant goal scoring threat of Everton. Now, if you lose Marwan on the cheap and you cannot bring a replacement and you cannot bring enough so you can replace the goals that he was given, <coughs> then you're in a bad position. The moment that you you see the situation as Marwan wants to go, there is a price on, on his head and there's a team that is prepared to pay that. If you are if you you put everything in place as a team and as a football club to okay move on and embrace it, you can be in a better place. And I think as you mentioned, James McCarthy comes in, Gareth Barry comes in. So you got instead of one midfielder, you got two midfielders. You bring Romaro Lukaku and you get you get all of a sudden, six players that they score over five goals, and we don't rely on one player. For the opposition, it's going to be a lot harder to play against Everton that's got five, six players that they can score than a team that relies on one specific way of scoring goals. So that's the, that's the answer. If you're going to lose someone, you need to end up being better off. Is it hard? Of course, because you need to do a lot of work beforehand and have the targets and be very strong in, in the dealings. But as I say, we'll never react. Oh, we lost such and such. What we're we doing? Then, it's, then you got a problem. But you need to understand the modern game. When you saw Cristiano Ronaldo leaving Manchester United, you know that in the modern game you need to be prepared for movement. I think players they are such an they are such an massive pressure because everything is recorded. Everything is sometimes they need a fresh challenge. They need to go somewhere else and impress other people. As you mentioned, foreign players sometimes one, two years and it's not and need to move on. And you need to accept that. As long as the club benefits from that, it's fine. And that's a great case, Madwan. The question was about you. <laughs> I just want you to say no, no, I'm here for a few years. The question about, about me is very, very clear. I've yeah. never been a manager in my career that I'm waiting for the next yeah. train or to jump. Um, I've got an incredible relationship with the, with the chairman. Uh, internally, the, the, the relationship has to be very strong and having a vision and everything needs to be in plan. We've got that. And at the moment, the only thing we need to do is go from strength to strength. But the club now has got that that position. I can guarantee you, it's a football philosophy, it's a way of working, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter if I'm here or it's another manager in 20 years or 15 or whatever. The club now is in a great direction. And I wouldn't be worried about who the manager is going to be or or what's going to happen in that respect, because that's going to be in part. <laughs> <laughs> 20, yeah, 20, yeah, 20, 20 was the first thing I heard. That'll do, me. That'll do me, leave it now. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that really hasn't been mentioned anywhere, it's the pre-season. Yes. Uh, Everton have yet to mention where we're going. And Which is we can. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. It's, uh, yeah. Obviously, a lot of times it can come down to commercial pressures, a lot of clubs go yeah, yeah, yeah. all around the world. Have you purposely left it late because yes. you, you weren't sure where we're going to be playing Champions League, Road to League, or, or otherwise? Yeah, there are two parts in the pre-season. The first part has is, is been clear for a long, long time. The second part was depending on the if it was the second qualifier round of the Europa League. Now we're clear that the, if everything goes well at the weekend, that we can only be involved in one qualifying round in the case that Hull City <laughs> wins the FA Cup. If not, we go straight to the, to the group stages. Those three cases, they're still there. So until that's sorted, we can't really um, decide which of the three options that we have for the pre-season. The pre-season, we're gonna, uh, we always got a period of six days uh, away from, from Finch, Finch Farm. Early on, we're coming back on the 10th, and then we're going away on the 14th. It's just a, a, a training, training camp. And then we're gonna go, there are three options. And as soon as this Sunday, after the FA Cup final, we'll be able to announce it to the fans. Is that one of the parts of the job that you enjoy here, that maybe we're at other club? It doesn't really matter when qualification starts, you will have to go on a tour to America, let's say for commercial reasons, and it's like Manchester United, because they've got a tour, they've been worried about being part of the Europa League, but yet they're yeah. still going on the tour because of the pressures of commercialism. But you don't have to worry about that as such? No, no, no. I think, I think it's just better to... Um, there are two options in life, not just in football. One, always hoping for the thing that you haven't got. And if you've got a tour, you want to stay at home. And if you stay at home, it will be great to travel. And if you've got 30 players, you want 15. If you've got 15, you want 30. Or 
embrace what you are and what you got, and then just work around that. And we got, uh, we got, we are uh, an incredible football club. Um, I'm quite happy to to be a little bit flexible with the second part of the preseason, but again, everything is very much in place if each of the options come out. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not one of those that always looking and thinking the grass is always green elsewhere. If they do this, they do that. I'm, I'm just thinking where that can go. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> we, we did enjoy the, the I thought the, the tournament last season in the USA was terrific. And I think if we could go there again, I don't think it would happen this season. But in seasons to come, I think it's something that it would become a priority for us. I did think that our preparation, in terms of games program, was fantastic. Um, the first part of the preseason, I like it to make to do it always between Switzerland, Austria, this sort of uh, uh, environment where you get a, a nice weather and you can do three sessions a day and you got no games and everything work. And then the second part is more a games program and we got a few options already on the table, but it'll be exciting. Remember that we got the Leon Osman testimonial in the weekend of the 9th of August, and that's going to be a big occasion. We got a few options again. <laughs> We won't be able to, to announce it because it's the committee of Leon that is, 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 is working on that. I'm quite happy to. As long as they bring good opposition, I'm happy. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, how's uh, Brian Lobbyer doing? Do you expect him to make the World Cup? Well, that uh, has been... If you ask the medical department since day one, they said, no way, they can't, they, can't, they can't make it. And then, after every week, he's just been telling everyone, I'm going to be fit, I'm going to be fit, I'm going to be fit. And now, He's been called up with Costa Rica in the in the in the first 30 names that they put together. So we're very happy with the way he's been recovering. Nobody knows if he's going to be ready or not. The reality is now he's not ready yet to participate in, in, in a football game. But on the 19th of May he's going to join Costa Rica, and then we obviously one one member of our medical department is going to be shadowing him. Uh, every day, and we'll find out on the 30th of, of May if it's made it or not. But just for the fact that he can be considered for it yeah. is, in, is incredible. What he's done. It's amazing. I understand you're going to the World Cup uh, yes. ESPN. Do you see that as a, an opportunity to scout players, or is yes. that the main reason to go? Yeah, that, yeah. Well, that and the excuse with my wife you know, <laughs> <laughs> to be watching every game in the World Cup. Now, it's, it's the, the world. World football goes into one place, which is fantastic for everything, for business, to talk, to scout, to, to get a lot of references. But uh, I did that in South Africa, and it was terrific to get uh, one day the players, clearly. The other is the preparation of, of different uh, cultures. Remember that we got a multicultural league here, and it's important to know how they concentrate with international football, how they work. For example, South American teams they like to share rooms they got two three players in one room European teams they would feel insulted by that it has to be single rooms and it's fascinating and I love I watch I watch uh, most of the teams when I'm there in Brazil would be impossible because the distance is well I'm going to watch at least four or five teams and then all the games I'm working with ESPN you got the, the access to all the games so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to follow that who do you think will win the World Cup you know what, if it would be in Europe, I, I couldn't see uh, a winner away from uh, Germany and Spain. I know that Spain, they are a little bit, the old generation are, are finding it difficult, but it's, it's in South America, and I can't see anyone winning it apart from a, a South American team. So it, it, it's not about the level, it's how they're going to adapt to the conditions, the way the football is played there. Brazil have to be favourite in, in that respect, and even Uruguay, Argentina, they could come good. And uh, it's, it's going to be fascinating from that point of view because I went, I watched the Confederations Cup last season, and Spain couldn't cope with Brazil, couldn't yeah. just just because of everything that, yeah, that the it, atmosphere was. Uh, yeah, but <coughs> the conditions and they press high up, and they, they normally they play through them. They couldn't, they, they couldn't get the second win, and uh, that's why I think it's so unpredictable this this World Cup. The unknown quantity of Belgium, but they've been very lucky in the draw, so they've got some good games, and I think they could grow into the tournament. Are they? A, we know that they are world-class individuals. Are they a team yet? Is, is a big question mark. Argentina, can Messi 
get the best level. There are many question marks, unknown question marks that been been played at Brazil. I think it'll be it'll be difficult for anyone to get at the level of Brazil. Thanks. You brought Aruna Kone to the club last summer, so you obviously have a lot of faith in his ability. Obviously, this season's been some kind of a write-off for him. I think he's only started one or two games. Yeah. I'm conscious of the fact that Romelu Lukaku may not be here next season. Do you think that Kone can be the player who can score 15, 20 goals and maybe replace Lukaku's goals next season? Well, Aruna, I think Aruna will be, without a doubt, a real success at Everton. I think. The, the fans will see the player that, that we have. It's been, as you said, it's been a, a disaster of a season. I think uh, at one point we were very fearful if we could come back. Yeah, it was such a bad injury. He, he had the meniscus and the cartilage in the knee. Uh, he lost a big part of it and the surgery was very successful, but it was touch and go. It's one of those surgeries that we can go either way. Now he's running, he's, he's a great number nine. Fantastic target man with a technical ability to hold the play, but link up play as well is a good finisher. Uh, I think he's going to be a massive, massive asset, and the fans will see the player that we have. But um, I wouldn't like to be one or the other. I would like to have Romelu <laughs> and Aruna. I think he's a space for both. In relation to that, then, um, obviously, Lukaku is clearly an immense talent. I think he scored something like 30 Premier League goals in the past two seasons. Yeah. Uh, I think some Evertonians are a bit torn as to whether he'd be worth a significant investment to this point. Do you think that he would be worth an investment of say twenty million plus for what he'd bring in the future as well as now? I think he would. I think he would and the reason is because you're not gonna get uh, a number nine with the qualities that Romelu has. Remember when you speak about a number nine you get or the player that is quick when is 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 electric and, and facing the opposition or the one that is a present and can play, uh, he's got a strong back to play. Romelu has got a strong back to play, he's an incredible, powerful boy in one-to-one -one situations when he faces the defender. He can link up play, he's good in the air, he can finish with the left, he can finish with the right. He's only 20 and then, as it's you scary. said, he scored 30 goals in the last 12 months. He's played now in, in different environments. He's already been through a big transfer fee, so it's not something they say, well, if you invest a big amount, maybe that will change the way he plays. He's been through that, and maybe he's, he's, he's learned from that. For me, he's a world worth player of investing big amounts of money. Will that be a possibility? We don't know, because you got the player, you got the parent club, there are many things that they're going to they're gonna play a part. But I always, when I speak about Romelu, he's it's been such an incredible footballer for Everton, that whatever happens in the future, that memory will be for him and for the fans, and that's, that was the key of that, of that look, so I'm happy with, with that, and then whatever happens in the future, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. And one more quick forward question, if you don't mind. Obviously, yeah. you brought in Traore on loan as well, and he's played one game and scored the goal, which yeah. is not a bad ratio, to be fair. Yeah. Um, has he sufficiently impressed you to one or other? He has, yeah, yeah. and I hope, I hope that he's fit for Sunday. So he can be involved on Sunday because it's quite unique in what Lasina brings, you know. And when you see a tall guy like him, you don't expect him to be coordinated enough to be technically so in control of the ball. Uh, I've been very impressed with Lasina. It's a shame he's, he's had a, a an hamstring problem that um, that's a, a concern and it's been an outgoing concern. And, Maybe it'll be something that, as a player, you always need to be um, aware of it in this future. But as a footballer, with that size, that pace, and the, the way that he is as a footballer, I think it would be a perfect fit for us for the future. How has he adapted to the club itself to the football? Really well, really well. He just, the first time that he watched a game in Goodison, he just fell in love. And I think he told whoever it was with him at the time, the agent or whatever, he said, I love the club already, I want to play here. And then when he played against Swansea, he scored, and obviously when, as a striker, you, you start a game and you score, that's, that's a oh, that's perfect a introduction. The warm-up at Chelsea was such a disappointment, because we work all week in certain aspects, and he was excited, he was ready. Before the game, you could see Samuel Eto and William, uh, introducing him and being very wary of his quality and he, they were talking about with, with the defenders uh, they were concerned about what he can bring and that, that's a great 
in a, a great sign, you know, when you see the respect between the players. And then he, he, he got the injury. Um, is I, I think I think Lacina has got the potential to be a, a really important player for us. But I think we'll find out a bit. He's trained really well this week. We'll see if he can be involved on Sunday. I think the next few days are going to tell us that if that's a possibility or not. Uh, um, it's been a very successful campaign, obviously, despite us just missing out on Champions League. Um, how do you see us evolving for, towards the next season? Well, um, I, I still think the group of players we've got now, they, are not, they haven't reached their full potential. And that, that excites me because when you look at where, how we can fulfill that potential, um, uh, I'm looking around the performances this season and thinking, can we? Can we break teams down? Yes, we can. Can we be well organized and hit teams on the counter and, and be strong? Uh, yes, we can. Can we go away from home and be uh, arrogant enough to play against the top teams and be ourselves? Yes, we've done that. Uh, all these signs are there. And then I'm looking at John Stones, Ross Barkley, James McCarthy, Seamus Coleman, very young players that they're going to just get better and better and better. As long as we don't lose the experienced players, I'm very excited. We need to look at performing exactly the same with European demands. I would be delighted if we can replicate what we've done this season with having success in, in Europe. And I would, I would consider success in Europe getting through the group stages into the second uh, round and see how we react in, in, in those sort of circumstances. But uh, we are getting consistently stronger. Which, is, is something that's going to give you a great, a great future. Just touching on the experienced players, which you've brought up a few times now, the likes of Tony Hibbert, etc. Obviously, Tony hasn't featured much at all mm. this season. Where do you see goals for players like that in the future as they're getting older and coming up to retirement? And Leon Osman's obviously got a testimony. Yeah, well, Leon is, is first and foremost, Leon is, a, is an experienced player but very fit. He's the only player that has been involved in every game in the league, and, and that's not easy because obviously. You need to be fully fit, you need to be able to, to adapt. And Leon is, is, is very much, I would say, in the prime of his career. How long he's going to carry on with that prime, we don't know, but it's, it's, it's very influential. Tony Hibbert has been very unfortunate a couple of times he picked up little niggles when he was going to play and cook games. Uh, the game where he played against Steven, I thought I saw Tony back to, to himself. Uh, I would love Tony to stay with us. I know he's out of contract and I need to speak with him, but when you get the experience of Tony, having a, a happy Tony Hewitt at the club will allow youngsters to fulfill their potential yeah. at the same time that he's got that uh, world of wisdom and, and he's a reliable footballer. So we're going to find out about Tony, but I would love to, to see him staying stay for a lot longer. Um. <coughs> Uncle Ferguson joined the first team coaching staff earlier this year. I was surprised that he was my hero mm -hmm. here growing up, but I suppose I never thought he'd have the discipline and focus to be a successful uh, coach. Um, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's it's true, no, no. But, um, you know, just from his history and so on. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what he brings to the training pitch, what he brings to the dressing room, uh, yeah. why, why you wanted him on board? I think the, the, to answer your question, which is, is, is what we all do, we, we see a player and we imagine him, that player as a coach or as a manager and it's hard to, to see Duncan doing that. The thing is, Duncan is not an ex-player. Uh, Duncan finished his career, he switched off from football, he took a little bit of a break and then all of a sudden he made the conscious decision that he wanted to be a coach and he wanted to be someone helping players through his own experiences and is opening himself up trying to see different ways of playing and so it's not Duncan Ferguson as a coach is not an ex-player Duncan Ferguson is a man that is in love with the game that he, he loves the club no end you, you cannot imagine and what he brings is incredible standards he's the first person in the building and the last one up he loves the game is an enthusiasm. He wants to to learn different systems, different 
uh, different ways of playing. He's been fascinated by the possession game. But obviously, as a player, he was he masters the direct football. If you want, how you rely on a number nine that he can bring the ball down. So he's got such a, a, a an open spectrum of how to play the game. It gives you great knowledge for the players. That one-to-one -one advice, that one-to-one -one work. Um, because he's been through difficult experiences as well. Because sometimes as a player, he would tell you that he made the right choices, uh, the wrong choices. He's got that, that bit of advice. And players look up to him saying, he's got, he's got the real know-how. So that respect that he brings into the, into the coach uh, is, is quite impressive. So I've been, I've been really impressed in the manner that, that Duncan has developed as a coach, but his influence has been very, very good. Does he aspire to be a manager one day? I hope so. I hope so. I think someone like him should 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 try to add that because it, it commands. I think is a leader. I think it commands real clarity in what the way you see things. It's not a you you meet the, when you meet people in football. You got the the ones they always doubt and they always what if and it's it's, it's very clear um, and and that's important to be a manager. Um, overall, I think I'm sure that he wants to um, naturally feel that he's ready and he's learned everything. And I think he's got he's got everything to be a, a very good manager. Obviously, you know, since you've come to Ellen, you've really done a history of the club. You know, look around all the pictures that we've got back up and all that. Bringing Duncan back into the fall and just sort of the job. Obviously, like the history is important to you. When you were a kid growing up in Spain, supporting Real Zaragoza, did you a know much about heaven? B did you know who played in the European Cup? No, I didn't know then, but I, I found out later. And uh, I know. According uh, to me, daddy kicked us off the park. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's not far off at all. Eh? <laughs> the the I, I always believed that. The history and the heritage of a club is, for me, is, is vital. I know that there are other managers that they just they don't want to look back and just move forward, and, and I accept that. I think, for me, all I want is everything I want to do is for, for the fans to be proud of. If you don't know the history and you don't know what's in the DNA of the club, you'll never know that. And then we are so privileged of the of the past that we have. I know that a lot of people say, well, we haven't done, we haven't won any title since 95, and this is a derogative that you're highlighting things. And it's the opposite. We've been successful. We've got nine league titles. We should be proud of that. And that should inspire the players that they come and they get the opportunity to play for Everton. So it's a very different way of, of approaching it. Um, when I was in Spain, we didn't get much footage of the British game, but the time that I, I got in touch with Everton, if you want, was when Gary Lineker signed for Barcelona, because obviously Gary Lineker was a big signing for Barcelona, and then we, they, they introduced all the way back where Gary Lineker made his name, and that was the goal scoring season that he had at Everton, and, and, and that was the first time I saw a picture of Goodison Park, and it looked at an incredible place to play football. So I, I think we are privileged uh, of our history. We shouldn't be ashamed that we haven't won anything since '95 because our history goes for over 100 years. So you can you can really look at beautiful memories from the Dixadean types and uh, and going through and it's just finding inspiration for the new generation to go forward and win silverware in the in the future. We talked talk before about young players who have stayed at the club. There have been a considerable number who have gone out of the club and have gone on loan. And, and last time again, we talked about their development and mm. why they do that. How have they developed and what can they sort of bring back to the club? Well, I, I, the way I, uh, the way we work it with Alan Irvine and Alan Stubbs and David Donsworth is, is, is very much individualised a programme for the players, for what they need. Uh, once they get the the under 21s, that's why the B league, the B teams would be perfect in that development. But all the individuals, they go through a process where after playing for the under 21s, they need to go out and get experience. And then we get them back and then we reassess it and send them back out again. And then when they come back and they've been successful, 
the decision is are they ready for the first team or we need to just promote the new generation underneath. So we have all, all these stories have been successful. Uh, I could tell you from Hallam Hope that he's found an incredible level at Bury, been a, top, uh, a good goal scorer and taken responsibility when he arrived at Bury was a, a difficult time, they had to get results. Uh, Matthew Kennedy, we had a very interesting uh, situation where he had gone to Tramia. He did really well when he came back. Uh, then he needed to work in other aspects of his game and we sent him out to MK Dons and now he's coming back with, with a real good positive report. Uh, Matthew Pennington, uh, I know at the end he's ended up with a, with a negative feeling because of the relegation of Tramia, but in terms of experience is, is incredible, even scoring as a right back, scoring in the last game of the season. Uh, so all these three players that I mentioned, they've gone from young players with potential to players. Now the next step will be to move them, move them to the next step. Um, Tyus Browning went away and he had a bad uh, experience, which it became a good experience to use him back into the first team. Luke Garvet is the player that is in the first team because he had a great time at Colchester and uh, Tolly's values went out to Blackpool and he found it very difficult and it didn't work out. Every every time a player goes out on loan it's very very um, um, helpful to see where the players are and how we can direct them and help them in their development. Um, that's why I, I would hope that one day we don't have to send anyone on loan, that we can do it in-house and the only way to do it is with the B, B, B teams, but all the, um, the all this, the on-loan stories, they've been a real success this season. Uh, even Francisco Junior, that is away now in, in Norway. The uh, the Europa League next season, um, being low to the base of teams saying they don't, you know, it's a waste of time, monetary mm -hmm. I don't look at it like that, I look at it as developing our brand and developing the club and the players a new way of playing new environments but from next year the winners go into the Champions League or into the qualifiers yeah does that make it almost a pro will, will that be a priority for us or do you look at it and think it's a way of growing rather than we can actually win it because I've watched some of them games and mm -hmm. some of the football we played this year we, we would have done quite well in it so how do you view it do you view it as a, a chance to grow mm -hmm. or do you actually view it as if we get up the group stages and we're, we're healthy after Christmas, mm -hmm. we've got a chance of uh, achieving yeah, something. Yeah, I think, the, the, first of all, I think the Europa League is an incredible competition. I don't agree with people that uh, that they, they want to be derogative or, or negative about that competition. I do think that if you want to be successful in the Champions League, you need to have an introduction through the Europa League and learn a lot and then you go into the Champions League and, and maybe you can be yourself. You're looking at Man City with all the money that they spend the first couple of seasons in the Champions League, they've been hard, hard and difficult. And I just hope that we can use the Europa League as a development process and, and a learning curve for everyone to try to get us as good as we can away from the domestic leagues. But I think you cannot look into a competition thinking, oh, we want to win it until you get into the latest stages. I think there are two competitions within the competition. is how you get on in group stages, uh, how the young players embrace playing in Europe, how you cope with teams that they're going to be completely different tactically, completely different in the way they're going to play. And then when you get into semi-finals, <coughs> you're looking at now, you've got uh, Juventus, uh, Benfica, uh, Sevilla and Valencia. They are, they are top Champions League uh, contenders. So the competition is as good as it gets. Now, when you get into that, that stage, then is the moment that you say, well, look at the others, can we really win this? Let's, let's have a proper go. But I think the early part of the competition is, <coughs> can we be successful in this competition? And be successful means, can we get results to get through? And can we get these results at the same time that we're getting results at home in the league and, and the FA Cup and the League Cup and we don't get affected? Because then is when you've got that, um, like, the mentality of a top, top club. And that's, you can only get that through experiencing and trying. Because I, I never understand when people say it's Thursday, Sunday and it'll affect us, but they want to be in the Champions League because the Champions League could be Wednesday, Saturday. No, the same period playing exactly the same once again, same rest period. So that, that's I've just never got that development. No. It's about being able to manage and you don't need to go by manager. Normally, normally what you get is that the Europa League, 
you, as a club, you need to make a decision. It's, when you're in the Champions League, it's because financially, and as a club, you can afford to have 28 or 29 yeah. top players. When you've got 28, 29 players that anyone can play, it doesn't matter if you play Wednesday and Saturday or Thursday and Sunday, you're okay. The problem is when you've got 20 players, and you've got two injuries and one suspension, and then you have to play Thursday and Saturday, yeah. or Thursday and Sunday. That is a problem. Yeah. But as a team, if we embrace playing in Europe, and we've got 28, 29 players, and we prepare for every game as we normally do, it shouldn't make a difference. But people get caught up because Europa League financially is not such a big reward. Champions League is. And then the teams that they are in Champions League, they got big enough squads to cope with that, with those demands. And we need to make sure that the demands are well calculated and we are well prepared to face both competitions without being affected by it. Because it should be remembered that the actual only European trophy we've ever won would have been one that would have been no one would have been interested now, which is obviously the Cup Winners' Cup, yes. no one would see value in it, but I had some of my greatest nights in 85, and big Bayern Munich and 14 of City and them kind of teams. It's it was a cup com a winner for cup com a competition for Cup Winners, rather, yeah, so yeah, people yeah. would have been uninterested in that now, and that's given Everton a, a massive part of the history. Yeah, no, I don't understand why people uh, don't see the, the worth on uh, European tournaments when they're not the European League or the... The European League or the Champions League. I don't understand it because uh, at the end, at the end of the tournament, you need to play against top teams in European football. You saw it, Chelsea won it last last season, and if you look every season, Benfica and, and Juventus, they are top teams that they, they they could easily win the Champions League. It's just at the right time, they're losing a game or not, and you get in one competition or another. But finding the way of having a, a an arrogant mentality where you can be successful in Europe for me is as uh, as important as do it in the Champions League to the Europa League. Similar. Thank you. Can I just quickly ask you as well, have you started your Panini World Cup sticker book? <laughs> well, mm. I, I've got I've got the great collection, but that's back in '82 when <laughs> it was World Cup. But, no, no, I, I never thought of doing it this year. I'll, I'll bring me swaps if you do start. <laughs> Um, do you believe that luck balances itself out over the season, or do you think it has done this season? Because we are a bit unlucky with a few decisions, like mm -hmm. away at Chelsea, away at Man City, uh, away at Cardiff, um, away at Tottenham. Yeah. So, do you think we've had that fair share of luck this season? No, you both ways, or? Remember that the way we are as a team, because we tend to have most of the possession. Uh, we are a team that we always need to break teams down. We are not a team that we're going to get favoured in decisions. It's, it's the way we are and the way we play. And but I always, my focus is to be good enough, you need to be able to achieve results without relying on decisions. I do think that we've been unfortunate, but uh, at times, and we've been fortunate other times, I don't think it balances up. I think that's a, that's a topic that I, I don't agree. But um, I always want to focus on being able to win games without relying on tight decisions and the right breaks. You need to be too superior, so you don't rely on other on third parties. So overall, I think we've been we've been uh, uh, okay with, with with the third party. Right. What are the consistent mark right this season? Is that we've moved the ball too slowly at times, and this has allowed the opposition to get them behind the ball. It's been difficult to break down. Mm -hmm. um, using Liverpool as an example last season, there was like a long-standing joke that they won the passing, but it wasn't very effective at times. <laughs> Obviously, this season, as you mentioned before, it's been a the same for core philosophy, but it's been more direct counter-attacking play, and it's obviously been very successful then. Are we looking to move the ball and transition more quickly? Well, I think to, to, to be a successful team, as I said before, you need to be flexible and adaptable, because the moment that you're not that, you become predictable. And we've seen it with the best team in, in my eyes, the best team now in world football is buying the Bayern Munich. Munich yeah. And against Real Madrid, they couldn't find a way. And I do think that we need to be flexible enough to be good at everything. I do think that you're going to get into a phase when you go from not being the, the main possession team into becoming the team with most of possession. You don't go from that to that in perfect. So it's going to be a process where you don't move the ball quick enough, that the angles are not right, that the, the way you get into the final third sometimes a little bit forceful. So it's a little bit of a Evolution, and I think every every fan of Goodison has seen a big difference between the games early on in the season and the way we finish at the end of the season. So the the aim is, can we get better in our possession football, which we need to get better, and then can we be good 
and dynamic and strong in the transition of the play that in the modern game you need. When you got players like uh, uh, Ross Barkley, which is probably the best football in transition in world football, you know that we're going to be strong in that respect. So if we got if we have good pace in the squad, we'll always be strong in that. But we want to be a team that we are capable of getting the ball from the keeper and go through 11 players. And that's that's the art of possession. That's good science. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And one more quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, Aidan McGeady, he brought him in in January, and I think it's fair to say that most Evertonians have been really impressed with his cameos. He's not yes. started many games. Is that a conscious decision with relation to his fitness, yes. or is it that you consider him to be at this moment in time an impact player? Yeah, no, I think the, when he arrived, Remember that Aidan McGeady was able to uh, sort it for the summer. That was a signing for the summer, mm -hmm. and at the end, we were able to, to bring him in January for a small compensation, with I felt that it was well worth it. And now he's well ahead of his Everton career, if that makes sense. But when he came back, he needed six weeks to get the, the fitness levels. Physically, now he's perfect. Um, he's adapted to the Premier League, which is the first time that he's played in our league. I do think he missed a pre-season from a tactical point of view. So I haven't been able to put him too much in games because he doesn't really know what the team needs, if that makes sense. And we'll get the best of Aiden after the pre-season. But I still think that everything that he's done has shown incredible magic fit. He's got a, a terrific 1v1 situation and uh, it's going to be a very important player for us for the future. Two as well. Yes, he does things in training that the players just go, wow, what happened there? And, and when when he'll be at the right position on the pitch at Goodison, I think the fans will see something that is, is quite a, a unique talent in, in those situations. Um, myself and Joe were talking in the reception about um, how media heavy your schedule is at the moment mm. um, and how you still seem to retain an enthusiasm for it and a positivity and you never seem jaded. How do you keep up your energy levels for that with the repetition from situations such as this? And I think it's just trying to, you don't see it as a chore. You don't see it, oh, I need to see the press now, I need to. I just enjoy the, the pure football debate and I'll never, I'll never hide from uh, being open and say what we're trying to do or what's the thinking behind doing things in a certain way. So I really enjoy that. I, I can see it for people that they just see it as a something that you need to tick the box or something to as a commitment, it can be, it can be really difficult. But I just enjoy the, uh, enjoy football full stop. So I, I always take anyone's view, and 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 I like to go into a debate because football is not right or wrong. It's, it's just matter of opinions and how you can get the ball in the back of the net. So it's, it's the way I see it. So I can get, I can get enjoyment out of talking and and, and, and facing the press in that respect. Thank you. Um, Danny Alves incident in Spain last week. Um, you know, a lot of people saying he handled it quite well. Yeah. It's not an unpleasant thing to happen, obviously. Yeah. Um, obviously, we could get thrown against a team from certain countries next season, Eastern European teams, mm. for example, where some of our black players might um, come into some racial abuse. Do you feel like you need to do anything to help them prepare for that, or do you feel like they're big enough characters to take it on the chin? Yeah, no, no, I, th I think obviously it's a, it's a very serious issue, and I think FIFA and the big organisations and, and, the big, and, and even the governments now, they need to they need to act, really. I think what happened in Spain is is really disappointing. Um, because I'm from Spain, I understand the culture and is a cultural issue. And some of the people that they do those things, they don't even realize what they're doing. They think that it's a joke, and it's something that is a bit of banter, and a bit of a, um, a bit of part of the game. And they are so wrong that they need to be educated. It's, um, like other countries, maybe they're doing it with a racist connotation, and and that's where I think the governments and the big institutions they need to they need to get hands on because a little bit educating the people. Um, our players they always been really strong in all these issues, but I do think that we will have to be aware, in depending what what sort of games we're facing, because that could be something that they are seeing they they see it as a as a joke or football banter. And clearly, we see it in a very different, different way, and sometimes that makes it a bigger issue than it actually is. And we need to be very, very careful. Yeah, 
one of the real success stories of the second half of the season been like Steve Naismith. And um, you know, prior to this season, so to speak, you know, we had a bit of time here. Mm. Um, do you think that was sort of about where he was playing or just the fact that his confidence was low and how did you build his confidence? I think I think any player when when you when you arrive to a new league you need a bit of adaptation period. Um, I think when, when Stevie arrived, he had to work so hard to, to be part of the team that I think he forgot about himself a little bit. And when I watch Stevie play, because when I arrived, I wanted to watch all the games from Everton and I watch all the games back. And, and I, I, Stephen Naismith, I didn't see the Stephen Naismith that he was playing for Rangers or even at Kilmarnock. I went to watch Stevie when he was at Kilmarnock, when I was manager at Swansea because he was this young, bright player with a lot of movement, very clever, playing in between lines. And that wasn't the Everton and Steven Nesmith. There was someone always concerned about his defensive role and working hard, and he didn't want to make mistakes. And, and it was a matter of sitting him down and saying, look, you need to be yourself. And then if you, by being yourself, you do well, you play. If you, by being not yourself, you don't play it, then you need to move on. You can't just be through football like being a is a punishment. And straight away, it's just he opened up and he was himself. Different Completely, but he's intelligent. I never, I never work with a player with that intelligence. Um, he's someone that is always, always attend in training. There's never an excuse. There's never a physically a hitch. Great, great levels for for ten minutes, and then he's got an incredible finishing. People don't see that. I he's a clinical finisher. Mm. Yes, that's finisher. You can tell just by position. One on one situations, especially, I think he's, he's brilliant. It's the position yeah. style as well. You take like shot. Movement, yeah. But then off the ball, if you give him three jobs, like there are players that you can give them one job. So look, mm. you're doing this. Steven Naismith, you could give him three jobs. You're doing this, but if he goes there, you're going to do this. And if we, you do that, he'll do it down to a T. And I thought his performance against Arsenal off the ball was as good as it gets. Do you feel more appreciated by the fans now as well? Obviously, because yeah. it's been a massive shift because there was quite a lot of Evertonians who were quite forceful in their opinions against them and it was quite negative atmosphere of games. Get, it was almost like a, like a, sar, a sarcastic, like if you, if you lost the ball, yeah, yeah. it'd be like a, a sarcastic element uh, and jeers and stuff. And it wasn't very pleasant, to be honest. But I think this year there's been a massive shift. Yeah. In terms of perception with the fans. Oh, well. Uh, he, he recognise that or? Oh, in, in, immensely. Immensely. I think, remember, as a player, you want to be professional and you want to just try to just get away from what's around you and, and concentrate on your job. But I always said that Goodison has got a special, mm. special effect in a positive manner. If that's a negative uh, wave, you can have a massive, massive negative effect. For Stevie, when I saw Stevie in the early games and as you say, it's a little bit of a sarcasm coming out of the terraces. That was a really tough time, and any any other player would have crumbled, yeah. and he would have found it impossible. He was opposite. He just wanted to to turn the perception around. You have to test him, too, isn't it? He has been, and he's a typical, typical Everton heart, you know, mm -hmm. someone that will never accept defeat. And I think I don't know who it was. It was Man United or Arsenal that we played at home, and he got. For the first time, first it's only Steven Naismith. Oh, Which one when he scored the first goal? When when I, was, I think so. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was special. And, and that was him, full circle, in yeah. nine minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, an incredible, incredible story. We've talked a lot about football and the time that you spend in football. Do you have any time outside of football and what sort of films, what sort of music do you like and all that sort Don't of stuff? They, the, this season, I managed. The chairman is giving me a few tickets to watch Evita, <laughs> <laughs> to watch Cabaret, and another one. So yeah, three shows I see this this year. But no, I, I just I switch off watching football. I'll, I enjoy it. It's a strange, it's a strange uh, therapy if you want. When you watch a game that you got no link whatsoever, and it doesn't matter what the result is, I get real satisfaction in just watching the game. And, See other people's problems, uh, and I really enjoy it. And therapeutic for me. <laughs> Just finally, then, have you been surprised by the way the Evertonians have taken to you? Because obviously, you came in at a time mm. 
bit unusual because normally when managers change clubs, it's because Something's they haven't done very badly, well. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. Everton yeah. have been doing quite well under the previous regime. And the fans have ob- you've obviously bought into the history, and the fans have mm. have bought back into that. And I've had a lot of messages on my way here just saying, "Tell them thanks for giving us Everton back." Have you felt that? Been surprised by the warmth and, and yeah. everything that you've had? No, I, I was very, very surprised how special Everton was for the fans and. And that, that was two incidents. One, when I arrived the first time at Goodison in the press conference, that I had at least six, seven people there, and, and they were proper fans, and I, I could see that that was their day. Like, that was the main moment of the day. And then when we went to Austria, Vienna, which we worked 20 sessions, and it was the 21st session was a physical against 11, so it's 10 by 10, and, that, and I'm looking at the way you stand, and I could see just blue uh, everywhere and I thought that can't be that can't be our fans is it <laughs> so at that point I said I need to find out what's this relationship between the fans and Everton just to understand it and that's where you get a little bit more captivated by it from that point on I always I must admit the support and the patience from the fans in the first three four weeks that that was for me the, the moment that I appreciate most of the fans because I knew it was difficult, I knew that everyone had their doubts and their question marks, can these players play that way, and we've got a successful team, now what are we going to do? And, and nobody, nobody was uh, disrespectful towards the work or the, towards the players, it was a real understanding, even the nil-nil against West Brom, uh, there were a lot of issues going on in the window, in the transfer window, and once we shoot the window, we beat Chelsea, just the support from the fans and the, the, the happiness from the fans has been has been fascinating. Like my final one, have you ever seen supporters celebrate a goal like Evertonians? Mm-hmm. Because we, when I watched other teams who were like Man City last night when they scored to obviously put no one put the trim, I'm not gonna say it, but put one <laughs> hand on the trophy and there's just a lot of clapping. We score against Anyone in the game that we've been mid table and everyone's hugging and kissing and it's yeah, yeah. absolute right. bedlam. So that's unique. just by you. That's I just me. It. I just kiss everyone. <laughs> <when we score. laughs> just. I got the. Uh, I got, we got. I don't know who brought it in, but it was a video of seven minutes of the fans celebrating at Old Trafford the victory, oh, yeah. and that was just one of the best insights that I had in an away stand, and it was incredible. And I think it's a. As you say, it's just that's that's what we are as Everton is, is football and it's, oh, it's those moments. Sorry, the last question and I've been asked about forty times, so asking if I forgot about it. Are you obviously this new song that's going around a bit? So I had a dream of you. Yes, but have I don't you know. Got, the have you got, no, no, I don't. Are we all singing it or what? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you which one do you prefer, Ali Ali O or Roberto had a dream? There's a the the one. Um, uh, I think the lyrics are fantastic. <laughs> That that we, had that what thing. I like about the School of Science uh, concept, I love, I love that that's because that's when you read about Will Cuff and when he's telling you about uh, I prefer more the way we play rather than the result, and that's me. And and it's very it's, it's spooky at times, you know, to see that that's so fitting. And the School of Science is is what I pride uh, myself in terms. Of our team needs to have that's what we're gonna do, and that's how we're gonna score a goal. And, the goal, Ross Barkley's goal against Man City, which is something that we do in training, that's from Tim Howard, goes through and it goes into the back of the net. And that's part of, that's the DNA of our club. So I love that that School of Science is reopened. You were meant to be here, that's why. Yes. I can only speak for myself, but I'm sure it's probably similar to everybody in this room now. But, you know, outside my wife and my kids, Job and that. It's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's more no, important no, than I, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that that's good. I'm going to keep it before me. I don't even know to work anymore. You know, this yeah. is just your cause, I don't you? <laughs> but I know that that's genuine, you know, and sometimes you can say it, but you don't really mean it in terms of that doesn't affect your life, and it does. I've seen it. Every Evertonian family is, is incredible, it's Everton, and then. I suppose it's, it's like you're in work Monday to Friday. I always think, you know, you're doing some like ridiculous, you know, some ridiculous task in work that you can't stand doing. In the back of your head, you think, oh, I'm going to match on something. I'll see Ross Barkley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My three year old just sings 
the best about the dream. He just walks around. He's, Does he? he doesn't say that much else. He just walks around <laughs> singing. Mark, I know, I know, mate. But I'm telling you, that's what he does. Crazy. Brilliant. Well, gents, thank you very much. It's been great yeah, to see you. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a great summer. Yeah. Enjoy and the World be, Cup. Be excited. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm looking forward to see two or three potential. I hope they have a shocker of a World Cup so we can afford them. <laughs> <laughs>